We see you. We see your assistant. Uh, uh, Fantastic. Tell us who your assistants are. All right. So I am joined by the intrepid uh, Dr. Neil Patel, who is uh, one of the fellows at uh, SSF, uh, joining uh, us from Penn State. Uh, and uh, of course, we have uh, Steve Birnbaum, who everybody knows, and, and Christian here as well. So uh, we're in good shape. What are you going to so, show us? How is so, this uh, patient, this cadaver, positioned? Right. And what so are you fixing the, to do? So the, the cadaver is positioned prone. Uh, and uh, the reason why we chose uh, prone corpectomy uh, is because it gives us options. So um, lateral corpectomy is a great direct way to get onto the vertebral body, uh, taking off the disc space above and below, and doing our corpectomy. Unsta let's say it's an unstable fracture around the thoracolumbar junction and we need uh, stability, we need that anterior column support. Uh, this prone position allows us to use a position familiar for every surgeon, which is the prone, uh, the prone positioning, uh, very familiar with respect to instrumentation of the screws, uh, uh, our ability to do our ponte osteotomies, uh, do, do whatever osteotomies we need to do, and at the same time, uh, you know, take, take the uh, anterior column approach to uh, dealing with the fracture and then support it uh, with, with a strut uh, or a cage as necessary. Uh, so for me, it's become a workhorse uh, for a lot of my uh, anterior work. I, I've converted all the way from lateral decubitus uh, directly to um, uh, prone. And uh, a couple of things to kind of point out here. Uh, one is that I use just the regular Jackson table. Uh, I like the one that, that gives you a bit of a gauge in terms of what degree of rotation. I, I put the patient, uh, the, there are custom-made positioners now that vendors have, but you could use the typical uh, orthopedic hip and knee uh, positioners, such as a uh, Allen uh, bolster and retractor. Uh, essentially, what you want to do is uh, tape around the chest pad. You want to tape around the hips. Uh, and then for me, uh, ergonomics is important, so I like to stand and work. So for me, I like to stand and work uh, looking down uh, at, at, my, at my surgical uh, site. Um, the other option is to sit, uh, but you're, you're working with your arms elevated, uh, which can be a little bit uh, cumbersome. So here in this case, what we've done is we've got a position on the table. Uh, we've, we've rotated the, the, the patient a little bit. And as I rotate the patient into my ergonomic uh, positioning, then uh, it's much very easy for me. So I don't know if you can see the uh, x-ray. Can you see the C-arm images? Not yet. We're seeing a retractor. In close-up, maybe we can split the screen. I don't know okay. if it's possible today. We've had some technical glitches, which I apologize to our audience. Yeah. Apologies for that. Uh, but uh, if you take my word for it, uh, we've essentially dilated down. Uh, uh, I, I believe this is... Uh, uh, I think this is one, two, three, four, uh, or three, L3, actually. Uh, we're now we see a split screen. We have the image up. Okay, great. So I've docked onto the vertebral body itself with the dilators, uh, and uh, at this point we have a retractor in. A couple of things to point out here. One is that uh, complication avoidance is, 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 is a big thing. Your approach is an incision. Uh, typically the rib will get in the way. And so uh, we, of course, want to avoid the subcostal vessels. We want to identify the rib. Uh, I, I use my doyens to clear the periosteal soft tissue off the rib. I work my way around. I avoid the subcostal vessels. I divide the rib. I try to get about six centimeters of rib. I can use that as graft. Then what I do uh, is that I, I typically dock onto the psoas muscle. Uh, if it's lumbar, if it's thoracal lumbar, uh, and I'm entering the pleural cavity, I, I want to stick to the plane of the endothoracic fascia, retropleural, uh, and I come down uh, along. I use the rib to come down uh, onto the vertebral body. Uh, now, uh, if, uh, for example, it's difficult uh, in the sense that I open the pleura or there's a pleural tear, it's not a big deal. At the end of the case, I'm able to uh, do a valsalva and, and get anesthesiology to push air out through uh, use of a red rubber catheter and that kind of thing. So I'm not too worried about the uh, parietal pleura. Just as long as I don't violate the visceral pleura, that's what matters. So, okay, so let's see if we can... Uh, uh, rotate uh, the, the table. I'll get you to come to an AP. So, yep. All right, so that's good. And then let's have, uh, let's take a shot there. Uh, 
Okay. So putting the dilator down and everything is completely the same thing. It is exactly the same you thing. Come on up. We're going to rotate the bed. Just if you follow the rotation. So if you follow with the C arm. Yep. And let's rotate a little bit more. Okay. Good. And see if you can uh, match us. Take a shot. All right. So not quite lined up yet. So keep going a little bit more. Let's take a shot there. Okay, we're getting there, a little bit more. You can just see the pedicles come into view with the owl's eye view. Uh, and you can see it at the level above, at least anyway. So uh, for the purposes of time, we're gonna assume that that is pretty close uh, to what we want. And then Steve, let's have the bed come up. So again, ergonomics is so important uh, to us. So, and then I'm, I'll take the uh, lights, yeah. So exactly like you said, uh, Jens, uh, this is just as if you would do it lateral decubitus. Uh, and I have not, uh, we have not prepared this before, so uh, technical difficulties meant that we get to do this together. So, okay. So I don't know if the camera can see. We can see the retractors and we see a wrench. We see right. the hand in front of the wrench. Okay. So I'm gonna make it very, very obvious here and open up nice and wide. Hopefully, uh, yeah, there we go. Hopefully you can kind of see the approach there. So the, the modern retractors have the ability to both open craniocaudally but also splay as well. I think you can see the psoas muscle there. Yes, actually quite nice. Yeah, some more light. Good job. Okay, so basically, uh, for the purpose of the camera, let's rotate the bed a little bit more, Steve. Okay, can you see a little bit more of that? That's pretty good there. Yeah. Okay, right. So again, so, just one more time. Lower picture is ventral. Yeah. Posterior, the retractor sitting on the TP, or what's that? Uh, yeah, so typically I use on? a shorter blade with a retractor. If it's thoracal lumbar spine, it'll, it'll sit on the rib head. That's where I really want it to sit. Uh, on, on the lumbar spine, I'd love for it to be at the level of the uh, neural foramen, which is, you know, a little bit marks the midline of the vertebral body for, for me, uh, or a little bit below that. Uh, but essentially, uh, my, my goal uh, is to avoid a, a, a plexus injury by staying in front of the plexus and moving uh, the, the muscles anteriorly. So uh, let's, have a, uh, let's have a cob. And of course, in, in real life, what we would do is we dilate down. Um, yep, I'll take the, the small cob here. And hopefully, we can see fibers of the psoas just being able to be pushed forward. There's neural monitoring, of course, that's happening. And once we're satisfied that we're, there it is. I think that's a, the, a disc there. I'll take a uh, shot there, please. OK, so that's the disc at the level below. Jens, you can appreciate yep. that. We see the disc quite nicely, actually. Good right. job. Yeah. And then. The and now we see a head. Right. I don't know if you can see this, but the vertebral body uh, is here. Good. I believe that's a segmental vessel kind of in this region here. And what's that that you're just reflecting right now? So uh, it's psoas muscle and fascia. Okay. So a couple of things to note. So obviously, uh, we're with the, 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 the bulk of the. Uh, nerve structures are behind us. Um, so we, we are uh, not moving the plexus anteriorly. Uh, now, at the level, the higher levels like L2 and so on, there's, there's, there's far less plexus involved. But L4 is critical in case uh, L4 is done. Uh, and you want to stay, obviously, in front of the source uh, there. So let's take a shot there from the plexus. There, there's the disc there. So at this point, what I may do is just mark out the, the disc there. So let's take a mallet. I'll take the, uh, actually, the, the retractor. Let's see if we can splay this open a little bit, the blue handle retractor. OK. I'm going to splay this a little bit so you can see a little bit more. A very good shot there on the AP. OK, that's nice and wide. So you can, you can appreciate that. Yes. All right. So. What I like to do, once I've defined it, I can either put a fourth blade on here, and we may do that, uh, or, you know, this is my 
plane immediately in front of the ALL. I'm very careful. Typically, there's a fat pad there. Uh, obviously, the big vessels are in front of us. So here's the anterior. We're very uh, aware of where our anterior is. Uh, on the lateral, uh, we saw where the posterior aspect of the vertebral body is. And remember, the mountain represents the disc, and the valley uh, is the mid-level of the corpus, uh, typically where the segmental vessels live. And we talked about complications. That's a major uh, thing to, to, to remember, is that you want to preserve or you want to be in control of uh, dividing uh, or um, uh, ligating or uh, you know, uh, doing uh, dithermy to the segmental vessels. You do not want an arterial <coughs> segmental vessel disappearing from you to in front of the vertebral body there. So, okay, so let's take a shot there. Okay, that's pretty good. I think that kind of defines our disc pretty well. So at this point, I, I start at the discs, a little bit like a cervical corpectomy in that you want to define, shut again. You want to define your margins to begin with. Shut again. And I'm trying to follow the angle of the disc, shot. Hey. News. Yeah. Uh, Dr. France has a question. Okay. So, you know, I always go, I always worry going behind the psoas. Where, where's, so which, which level is this? So I, th you know, we can, we can measure it. I think that I see the rib about three up from us. Okay. So come south for us just a little bit to show. I, I guess my question is, yeah. where's, where's the see. nerve root coming out there? Because it tends to come out into the psoas. It does. And yeah, so it, you're behind, you're almost behind where the root is. Where's your root? Oh. Right. So the root hopefully is here. It's behind us here, right? So we're in front of the root. So we're not, we're not dragging the root from, uh, from above uh, ventrally. So it's behind this uh, posterior retractor. So, so you, you didn't can, bring the whole psoas anterior. No, 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 no. Only a little part of it. Only the okay. the component that I, I am co confident that there's no plexus in. And and same with down here. I think the plexus is going to run from superior to inferior, from posterior to ventral. Right. So it's in that plane. That's the angle. Uh, and of course, remember, I'm monitoring this, uh, and I'm using triggered EMG uh, to to be able to kind of identify, um, you know, where 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 it's lowest current. Here you can see the disc there. Um, that's pretty clear as well. And so again, I stay away from the ALL. And here, same thing. So if you want to mallet me, yeah. let's take a shot just before we start. OK, so one hey, sec. And news, just to not terrorize you, but we probably have about a 10-minute limit. Yeah. I know this is uh, speed pressure. Go ahead. You're doing a great job, by the way. Ah, shot. Keep going. Don't be shy. Keep going, stop, okay, and don't be too, uh, be a little shy, yeah, keep going. Poor Dr. Patel, I've terrified That's him. That's it, shy. All right, let's put some neurosurgical muscle into this, let's go. That's it, keep going. So uh, my point here is that I cross the disc spaces, okay, I'm not concerned about the disc spaces so much unless there's a massive osteophyte there. You can break through the other side just a little bit. There we go. So we've busted through the annulus on the other side, Jens, okay? So I've now defined my inferior, my superior margin here. Remember the mountain and the valley. I've ligated the segmental vessels, and, and this is the quadrant that I'm going to be working in. So let's have an osteotome now, if we can, uh, and pituitary. So. Next step is, of course, to do your discectomy. If we have a narrower pituitary, that would be... Okay. Anybody got a Raytech? Do the great vessels fall more anteriorly when you're prone? Yes, a and this is the beauty of it. So I don't rely on it, Jens. I, I'm, not, I'm always cautious. Um, but better than the great vessels is the peritoneum and the bowel. Okay, so the beauty of prone is that gravity can be your friend. It can be your enemy too in terms of retractor placement. But if you are careful with respect to um, where you dock initially and you're careful with respect to deviation of the retractor, take a shot there. Okay, so then you, you can use it to your advantage. The other thing to say is that, there, you know, Prone isn't lateral just turned on the side, okay? So we have a bolster on the other side that pushes uh, 
onto the contralateral aspect of the patient. So when I use an osteotome or a cob uh, or, or even a trial, what I'm doing is I'm moving the spine away from me. And so I have to be careful of that because remember my retractor is sitting on the vertebrates, docked on there, and I don't want a slip of the psoas muscle to come underneath my retractor and for, for a little bit of plexus to, to come through. Can okay. I just, Jim Harrop, real quick question. Yeah. You mentioned before, that, and I totally agree with you, all the visceral structures fall forward, but yeah. don't your nerve roots also fall forward? Yeah, it's a real good question. But Jim, remember that we're not bending the knee like we are in the decubitus position. So the way the patient is positioned on the Jackson table, the thigh is extended. So in doing that, you're making Tension. the psoas muscle a little taut. So if anything, you're pushing the nerve roots back. The, the, the plexus is, is, is entirely within the psoas muscle. So if you keep the psoas muscle taut and stretched, within reason, obviously, you're not hyperextending the thigh. Then I guess my, oh. You also take the psoas back too, the, the lumbar plexus back then too. Should we be doing that on a lateral? Um, it's a good question. So uh, I think the beauty of a decubitus um, is that, and I'm totally going to contradict myself here, but the beauty of decubitus is that by keeping the psoas muscle relaxed, you can argue uh, that there's less tension on, on the, on the um, plexus. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's always been easier to relax the thigh a little bit uh, so you can identify the psoas when you dock on it, uh, you know, in the decubitus position. Um, you don't have a choice with um, a prone, right? So your thigh is going to be extended. Um, you, you could, I guess, make a sling and have the knees flex a little bit. But in, in my case, uh, it's always, I, I, I don't think in the wash it makes too much of a difference. You just got to be careful to identify where you're at and, and avoid... Um, you know, uh, wandering posteriorly, uh, blindly, uh, or, or ventrally. All right, so let's take a shot here. Okay, so I like that. We're going to move up just a little bit. Shot there again. Okay, so let's start close to that disc. And Okay, go for it. Yeah. Shot. And so th this is the value of having navigation. So I want to uh, stop there. I want to point something out. There is really no reason to go past the contralateral pedicle, right? So I'm taking the ipsilateral pedicle uh, and all of the corpus to the level of the contralateral pedicle. Why? Because I want to avoid injury to the segmental vessels on the other side. I've seen it. Segmental vessel injury on the other side, I mean, my God, good luck to you because it's difficult to control the bleeding, right? So it turns into uh, a, a mess uh, if, if you let it happen. Uh, so a good marker is to keep that contralateral pedicle as a little bit of a, a, a guide or, or a uh, limit for, for how far you go to the other side. Okay, keep going. Stop and take a shot. All right, so there's the, the there's, we're going to move up just a little bit there. Okay, take a shot there. Okay, and shot again. And presuming that we're right on the edge of the, the, the body there. And x-ray. Okay, all right. Let's go for it there. X-ray. So I use navigation for this part typically. And there it is. There I'm, I'm at the level of the contralateral pedicle. And I can clean it up a little bit more, okay. X-ray there. So I'm going to get into that this space and just push that fragment down. All right. And now here, I know where my ventral limit is. I stay shy of it. There's no reason to come close to the ALL there. Shot. Okay, I'm ventral now. Shot. Keep going. Uh-huh, and a little bit more. Good. All right. And a little bit down here to the disc. I've marked out my territory. No need for a shot because I can see where my cut is already. Okay. All right, so at this point, we freed up enough of the corpus to be able to remove most of it. How and good is your ability to visualize the dural sac and remove posterior fracture? Yeah, the so that, burst fracture? that requires work. And to be frank with you, the beauty 
of having them in the prone position, Jens, is that I can do most of my body work uh, lateral, and then from the back, uh, you know, I can open, I can push the fragment down into the space that I've created, and uh, with careful dissection, freeing up uh, of, of the PLL, I can move it um, into that ventral space and remove it. So that gives me a major advantage. And here it comes. So, of course, in real life, we'd be a little bit more uh, uh, circumspect about it. But we are essentially creating our cavity. X-ray there. OK, we're respecting the end plate of the level below. And same with the buff shot there. And OK. So in order to save time, Jens, I think the, the, the main thing is that what we can do is clean this up. But um, at this point, let's say that I've taken enough body. So I use yes. a trial typically. So let's see a trial there. OK. So. We can start, it's a little bit big, so shot there. I think that's too, too big for the ver. Oh, yeah, it might be just right for the defect. X-ray there. I think that's perfect in terms of height. OK. And what diameter was this? I think a 20 millimeter diameter would be ideal. Yeah. So again, close attention to the end plates of the level above and below. Uh, I use a curette uh, or an osteotome to get perfectly into that plane uh, to, to, uh, to clean out uh, the, the end plates. The other complication, so let's say that you did have uh, brisk bleeding, and you will get brisk bleeding, obviously, just from removing the vertebral body, and a trauma, you will, um, just because of the, of the uh, injury. Um, but I think that as long as you can uh, recognize no arterial bleeding, then you can, you can control the bleeding. You can control the venous bleeding. OK. All right, we have a cage ready. So for the purpose, will it collapse any further, guys, or no? OK. So this is an expandable yeah. cage that you're going to use? It's an expandable cage. I'm going to use an expandable cage. Uh, now, right now, it's not an expandable cage because it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's a little bit big. But uh, that's OK for the purpose of the exercise. That's a 30. Can you just put your head away so we can see that cage yeah. in close up? Yeah. So if you can see it going in. Yes. Nice. OK. And what I can do is, is utilize this to kind of make sure that I'm in front or behind the ALL. Yep, which I am. OK. I'm make just That's beautiful. Yeah, if you can hold that retract in there. Yeah. Can you see, guys? Yes. Nice. All right. So here we go. And let's take a shot there. OK. All right, so Neil, if you would do the honors. Shot there. That looks ambitious. Yeah, I think, you know, the, uh, Jens, obviously we would collapse this in real life. I think either way, we're going to make this happen. Shot. I think you're at the wrong level. <laughs> Getting close to the end plate. Dr. There. Treadway's giving helpful advice. Yeah, I might just take that from you, yeah. <laughs> Shot? I mean, the, the purpose of the exercise isn't to show you yeah. uh, a cage going in, but we have no smaller cage, guys, at all. Uh, uh, OK. OK, anyway. We, so, we need a collapsible, not an expandable cage. Yeah, yeah. I okay. think we see the principle. I think imagine you've done a, a job. perfectly placed cage uh, in there, uh, expanding to cover the uh, end plate of of the of the uh, vertebral uh, to co to cover the end plate. And uh, the the beauty again of the prone position, Jens, is that now I can get. Uh, posteriorly, I would have had screws in. My workflow is to put the screws in, uh, to do uh, exposure and decompression, uh, and uh, to tamp the fragment in ventrally if I could, uh, and uh, utilize my space ventrally to remove those fragments. So I think it provides you a 360-degree uh, uh, decompression. Um, 
Uh, again, complication avoidance is, is, is number one. You want to dock posteriorly. Uh, you want to have the appropriate retractor a blade, particularly the thoracolumbar junction where there's a rib head there. Uh, you want to make sure that the, you manage the segmentals. Uh, you, if you're working retropleural, uh, uh, parietal pleural opening, you try to avoid it, but it's almost inevitable. Uh, I, I don't even repair it anymore. I used to do that. And I'm not worried about the muscular fibers of the diaphragm. I don't need to repair it. Uh, typically, uh, it's not an issue. Um, I think the only other thing to say, like we said, is that you don't want to impact the segmentals on the other side. And from time to time, uh, I use navigation, but if you don't have that, rotate the patient back into the perfect prone position, swing the C-arm in, get a lateral, convince yourself that you're not drifting ventrally. Um, and uh, the uh, option of a plate uh, is always there. Um, uh, I, I think that posterior fixation for me uh, is the best uh, belt and brace. Uh, but uh, this works. I'm familiar with this position. Uh, I think we're all familiar with, with prone. Uh, and I think that more, more of us are likely to use this as an anterior approach uh, than if we were just relying on decubitus and then flipping the patient uh, with all the things that come with a flip. So, yeah. I think you did a great job of the dissection. One last thing before we switch to odontoid fractures, because the last thing that separates us from lunch. Can you put a probe in there? Uh, we have a really nice view in there. This is actually very encouraging. And show us where the neural canal would be. So if you can go back in the camera that a, shows coaxially down. Probe? Yeah. And put like a long Penfield probe in there, a long Woodson right. type. So you, pr you, want a, you want a lateral, right? Yes. OK, so let us have the, ro the bed rotate. So you're going to come to a lateral. Because that's, again, uh, my colleague, Dr. Skrin, who's an artist, has done this a couple of times, and we found it very hard to actually and go into the canal. That, um, not the big holder. I think we, the, we're losing vision one. now. No, was, we're okay, losing sorry. Vision. Uh, so it, it's going to be hard with him to take a shot because the, the, the arc of the C-arm can't, can't do it. I wonder if, you, if the camera can move at all. Do you have a coker or something? I can't yeah, perfect. Further. Okay, we can't go further, but, but maybe Good. we can. Okay, look, yeah, look let, let's enough. stop it. We'll meet, need to move on. Okay. We'll discuss the merits, risks, and limitations of PTP, which you demonstrated very nicely later in our final. Oh, now we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys can see, how much yes. of this can you see? Can you see much? Yeah, no, I mean, we're getting to the Gestalt. I think that's. Yeah. Yeah, because this is my one big uh, gripe that even in the hands of a master like you or Dr. Esquin, getting to see the actual dural sac in this prone procedure is not that straightforward. Yeah. Now we're getting there. We're getting there. We're starting to see something. There it is. It looks beautiful, Jens. There, uh, you can see it. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Excellent. No, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. So let's, oh, Dr. Abdul Jabbar had a question. And yeah. No, if we want to move forward, it's fine. Uh, Amir Abdul Jabbar here. Nuj, before you go, yeah. um, you know, I, I feel like in we're dealing with unstable burst fractures. Uh, a lot of times I'll do a longer segment if I'm doing it all posteriorly. Um, when I'm backing it up with an anterior column, I feel like I can do a shorter segment. Um, if you, with this technique, do you feel like it changes the um, approach that you're going to use posteriorly? when yeah, you have yeah. this anterior column support? Right, really good question. So, I, you know, I, I've evolved. Um, I used to just put a plate on above and below, four-hole plate with screws. It wasn't enough uh, because I, the patient would translate. So I, I, I think that I still prefer two up uh, and two down. Um, in, in, my, uh, in, in, in some cases, people have described one up and down in terms of posterior fixation. Um, I think that's totally legitimate because you have just put in a massive strut in the anterior column. Um, remember, I use navigation. I try to be as MIS as possible. So for me to use navigation uh, to put a screw uh, above and below uh, through, for example, one single incision but keep the fascia intact and just you know, perk the fascia, uh, poke holes in the fascia to put the screw in um, is, is not, you know, stripping the posterior uh, muscles uh, off the spinous processes and so on. So I'm not scared of that, but I take your point. Um, so it hasn't really changed the posterior approach for me just because I've been burnt uh, with, with a shorter construct in the past, but at least I can do it MIS. Uh, and I think that just disrupts everything less. 
Great, thank you. Great question. All right, last thing before our lunch break, and we want to finish this session, 12.30, so we're totally on time again. Dr. Andrew Daly.